So Dr. Alvaro Huerta holds a joint faculty appointment in urban and regional planning and ethnic and women's studies here at Cal Poly. He's the author of the book, Reframing the Latino Immigration Debate Towards a Humani Humanistic Paradigm. He's also the lead editor of volume four, People of Color in the United States, Contemporary Issues in Education, Work, Communities, Health, and Immigration. Dr. Huerta holds a PhD in city and regional planning from UC Berkeley. He also holds an MA in urban planning and a BA in history from UCLA. As an interdisciplinary scholar, he teaches and conducts research on the intersecting domains of community and economic development, Chicana, Chicano, and Latina, Latino studies, immigration and the Mexican diaspora, social movements, and social networks and the informal economy. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Huerta to the stage, please. Buenas tardes. Is it tardes? How does that work? Good afternoon. Is tardes? Buenos dias. I got to work on my Mexican uh, Spanish here. I'm very happy uh, to be here. Uh, I really appreciate the invite uh, from the directors of, the, of this wonderful program. And when I look at all of you here, I see a lot of smart, young, energetic, good looking people. Cal Poly is a great university. It's a university that has been noted just recently in the New York Times as one of the top five uh, universities that help promote upward mobility from people that come from working class uh, families. They told me a little bit about you and what you have to do to qualify for this program. And when they, when they mentioned first generation, uh, low income, and things of that nature, I said to myself, hey, that's me. I grew up, and I'll talk a little bit in the slides about my, my background. I come from a big family, big Mexican family. I have. Um, seven brothers and sisters, 10 uncles and aunts. Each one has 10 kids, so I have like 100 first cousins. So luckily when I go to a, a wedding or a quinceanera, half of them are Maria and Jose, so I, I can figure out what their names are, you know. Jose, is that you? <laughs> Both of my parents didn't go to school. They were from Michoacan. They were uh, from the rancho. And I, like my brother Salomon Huerta, managed to go to the best universities in the world. So how did that happen? You know, I'll talk a little bit about that. But I say that because, like all of you, when I first entered the university, well, maybe it's just me, but I felt a little bit uneasy, you know, like I didn't belong, like it wasn't for me. By the time I went to UCLA, and as a freshman, a 17-year-old kid from the projects, there wasn't that many people that looked like me. There wasn't that many people that came from where I came from. Even the Mexicans that were there, they were middle class, upper class. They were like the kids were like, uh, sons of presidents of Mexico, of Latin America, ambassadors. So there's also not just a racial issue here, but also a class issue. So you could be African American, but if you're upper middle class, is different than being African American in, in lower class in, or you know lower status in terms of economics, right? It's a big difference. So it's a big difference if, <clears throat> for all of you. It's a, it's a big difference you entering the university, and then later in life, if you have children or if you have children now, that those kids entering the university. It's a big difference. The, the experience is different. Is different for you than to them for them because by the time they. Uh, or if you have nephews and nieces and brothers and sisters, it's gonna be easier, it's gonna be different, it's gonna be better for them, right? Because all of you here, are, as far as I'm concerned, are heroes, you know, you're trailblazers, all of you. You know, I wouldn't wanna be anywhere else, you know. I've taught at UCLA and I've taught at Berkeley. So when I'm here, I feel more comfortable. I feel like I'm with my people, my peeps. <laughs> all right, so let's get the show started here. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about immigration and I'm not going to read the slides verbatim, it, but I'm just going to look at, use them more as references. And a lot of what I talk about is, is in my book, 
Uh, it's available for $15, and I'll give it to all of you, too, for $30. So it's up to you. It's a special. And I have a radical idea, and I think I have the most radical idea in the world, and I think this program is, is going to get in trouble because they hired me to come here. I didn't, they didn't hire me. They asked me to come. And I'm going to push the most radical idea that, that anybody has ever heard in the world. And it's that immigrants should not be treated as immigrants, but as human beings. That's, that's the idea. That we should not see immigrants, we shouldn't put a label on people and call them immigrants. Or other derogatory terms that are, that are referred to them, where they're separated from others. Right? So once you start putting a label on someone and you refer to them as an alien or something other than a human being, then it's easy to exploit them, it's easy to deport them, it's easy to exterminate them like what happened in, in Nazi Germany. Well, you know, I am a social scientist and I do work with labels, I'm against certain labels. I'm against labels that dehumanize people. And the poor people, the, the, the people that are dehumanizing the Mexicans, the Muslims, the Chinese, they don't even know it. But by dehumanizing somebody, they themselves are de being dehumanized. They don't even know it. Right? So when you dehumanize somebody, when you bully somebody, in the process of doing that, you yourself are no longer a human being. You no longer have compassion for others. So that's the most radical idea that I've ever come up with in my entire life. And I'm sticking with it until they fire me. But I don't have your support, so... So before the Donald J. Trump became president, he started off his presidential campaign. The, that day, when he announces his, his candidacy for president of the United States, the most powerful country in the history of, of mankind, he started off on the backs of Mexicans. He started off attacking Mexicans, generalizing referring to Mexicans as rapists, as criminals, as murderers. And then he said, and some are not. I mean, I was recently, recently invited to a talk, not a talk, an, in, an interview. You know, I've been in different talks, and Tavis Miley and others. And I was invited to another one, a very conservative uh, African-American gentleman. He refers to himself as American. That's okay. To each his own. And he started to argue, he was saying that, no, he only meant some, not all. No, he said, when you say some are not, then what you're saying is most are. In other words, you're generalizing. You can't generalize. You can't say all people, that all Muslims are terrorists, or all Chinese are bad, or all uh, Koreans are bad. You know, you cannot do that. Unless you're referring to the KKK or the Nazis, you cannot generalize about a group and lump them together into one negative category. You can't. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense, and it's, it's, it's wrong. And if you take my class and you do that, you're not going to get an A. So you don't generalize. And if you do generalize about a group, then have evidence to back it up. Support it with evidence. Show me the records of, of all the criminal activity by these people. Show me evidence. Not, Conway's alternative facts, but evidence that, that, that we can refer to. So this idea, I started this presentation a few years ago, or not, not a couple of years ago, and talking about Latinos and Latino immigrants, but I'm going back to my roots. This is about Mexicans. This is about Mexicans, because the, the, the president continues to bash Mexicans. He continues to blame Mexicans the, the entire all of the problems that Americans face today, drug addiction, homelessness, uh, lack of college affordability, all, all of the problems seem to be the, the, pro the fault of Mexicans. And to solve this problem with the Mexicans, we need to build a wall. And to solve the problems of the 9-11 the and the terrorists, we need to ban all Muslims. There's over a billion Muslims in the world. Let's say there's a thousand terrorists that are Muslims. Or let's say there's 10,000. 
a thousand compared to a billion? So can you say all of them are terrorists? You can't. And if you're going to ban Muslims from six, seven countries, why don't you include Saudi Arabia? Because that's where the terrorists came from. So these are things when I, when you take my class, and when I mentor students, whether you're an undergraduate student or a doctoral student or even assistant professors from other universities, I always tell them the same thing. I don't want you to agree with everything I have to say. And actually, I don't want people to agree with me at all. What I want you to do is, is to question, is to be critical. You know, to always don't assume just because the government is telling us something that is true. So you have to question, because all governments lie. All, the Mexican government, the Chinese government, the Korean, they all lie. They all say something and they do something else. So that we have to accept when someone says something, we can't accept it as truth. We have to force them to provide evidence of, of that. I mean, a lot of times parents lie too. You know, they'll tell you something, right? So even as authority figures, parents lie. But because you're dependent on them financially, you have to go along with them. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you say, where's my $20? You know? Right? So the, the idea here, what I'm arguing is, is anything that anybody argues is that we don't accept it as truth just because they're in power, just because they say so. And that goes for myself as well. So what I'm saying is that we need to be critical. We need to be critical of statements that lump people together. And when we're thinking about racism, racism is something that has, is not just a black and white issue. Because every time we think about racism, we think about Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, you know, Malcolm X, civil rights movement. But we, we know, those of us that study history, that the, the United States has a long history of racism against a people of Mexican descent. So here we see a slide in the early 1900s where over one to two million Mexicans were being deported during the early stages of the, the Great Depression. They were being blamed for the joblessness of the Americans, once again. So these things uh, are recurring themes. It's not new. There's too much focus on Trump. Trump is not the problem. The problem is that the American system, the American government, and people that are in charge always look for people to blame scapegoats to blame when there's economic crisis. So it's easy to blame the Mexicans when, when uh, white Americans are unemployed because the government can say, well, it's not our, it's not our fault, it's, it's those, those brown people over there, and we get rid of them and all our, sol all our problems will be solved. So in, the, in the 19, <coughs> 1940s to uh, 1960s, there was a program, the Bracero program, so while on the one, while on the one hand uh, the, the U.S. government is attacking, is, is blaming Mexicans that took their land in uh, 1848, half their land, we see that when there's a need of labor because of the World War II, then there is a call for Mexicans to come. But not as citizens, as guest workers. And my father was one of those, my uncles, my, my grandfather was one of those. So for me it's not, a, it's not necessarily an academic issue, it's also a personal, and also my father-in-law. And as you can see in one of these, in one of the pictures that I just showed, that were before they arrived in the United States and process, they were, were forced to strip naked and, and sprayed DDT. And DDT, we know, causes cancer. So these are issues that we, we see how they're dehumanized, not just verbally, but also physically. And also we see here the, the 1940s also uh, what's called the Zutsu riots. But it shouldn't be really called a Zutsu, right? Because it implies that these Zutsuters, these Pachucos of the time, it implies that they're the ones causing the riots. And it wasn't. It was a Navy men that were coming home or on, on furlough or what, what have you, uh, coming home and, and beating up these Mexican uh, youth that dressed in a certain way. But the deportations were, is it, didn't end. It, it didn't end in the in the uh, during the Great Depression. After the Great Depression, after the Mexicans are are here uh, working the fields and, and helping with railroads in Oregon and other states, we see that Mexicans are being deported once again. 
this is after World War II, where the United States economy boomed and there was a lot of economic activity and you, you saw growth and you saw people going to college and you saw be people buying their homes and so on and so forth, mainly white middle class men you know, coming after the war and their families, but you see now Mexicans are being deported. So they're working the farms, they're working the farms, but in the cities they're being deported under what's called the Operation Wetback. And during this, this time also you see, during this period we see, this is not just against Mexicans, the Japanese are put in camps as well, right? So it's, it's, this presentation is mainly focused on Mexicans, but there's other, I try to make parallels with other groups. So for me it's important that we see, once again, when we look at Mexicans um, and other ethnic groups, other racialized groups, we see their humanity. We don't treat them as, as immigrants, we don't treat them as aliens, we treat them as human beings. I mean, if you think about it, everybody has migrated at one point or another. So if your family, if they're from Texas, and then they came to the United States, aren't they migrants? Why don't we call them migrants? Right, so if, if your family, uh, you're, you're white, you're, you're, you came in the early, 19, your grandparents came in the early 1900s after the Dust Bowl, you know, came to California, aren't you migrants? Isn't that, didn't people move? How many people can say that, that they live in the same house that they were born in or that their parents live in the same house that they were born in? I, so at one point or another, everybody has moved. So why are they called migrants? Why are only brown people called migrants? So migration is the most natural thing uh, mankind. At the end of the day, people, at the end of the day, we all come from Africa. So we all migrated from somewhere. It's just, it's, we just have to not be so arbitrary and like, where do we cut the line? You know, where do we say, you know, here's the line? I mean, Trump's grandparents were I immigrants and his wife is an immigrant. So do we have good immigrants and bad immigrants? Are the good ones white and the, the bad ones are brown? I mean, these are things that I want people to question, not, not to assume that just because they tell us something is true. You know, so we look at criminality, I mean, what is, how can we label somebody a criminal? How many of your parents have cheated on their taxes? You know, are they criminals? Right? I mean, how many of you jaywalked? Are you a criminal now? Because you're a U.S. born citizen, all of a sudden you're a criminal? In the city of L.A. until recent, recently, I mean, we have Latino mayors, we have Latino council members, but what good are they? What good are they if for many years street vendors were considered criminals under the law. So if you're Salvadorian and if you want a pupusa and a lady is selling pupusas in MacArthur Park, she could be cited, she could be sent to jail, she could be fined, just like somebody selling crack or, or somebody selling cocaine across the street. And it wasn't until recently that the, the city of LA has moved against, against decriminalizing street vendors because of what's happening with Trump. But where were they before Trump? See, it's not just about Trump. We have to look at the institutions, and we have to look at how is, that, how is it that our country, those of us that are citizens, I was born here, how do they treat the less privileged? How do they treat the criminals, how, the, the, the people in jail, the, the, the immigrants, you know, the, the poor people? You know, how, how, that's how you, how you judge a country. You know, when we just have people that just want to have stability, they, they want to have, you know, make a better life for themselves, and all of a sudden they're rapists. To me, it makes no sense uh, what's, whatsoever. You know, for a long time, Republicans or conservatives, I'm, not, I'm neither a Republican or a cons uh, re neither a Republican or a Democrat, I'm an independent, so I am an equal opportunity criticizer. I criticize everybody equally. You know, Trump is for the wall, so was Obama. Trump is deporting people as, we, as I speak. Obama deported 2.5 million uh, people during his administration, more than any administration in the, in the history of the United States, right? So when we look at uh, conservatives, a lot of times, and they don't talk about it as much, but they always talk about family values, this idea of family values. There's no more family values than the Mexican people, people. When we come to family, we don't mess around. We should, they should be like <laughs> the Olympics on family values. At any, point in, in, at any point in any family, you have the aunt living there, the, and then we have comadres, compadres, padrinos, madrinas, we don't mess around. 
A lot of times we don't differentiate. We treat our brother just like we're our cousin. We don't, we don't see the difference. You know, for us, all our, our, our relatives, we see them as our family is not a nuclear family. It's an extended family. I mean, you could go anywhere. You can show up. You can show up right now. If, if you're from, usually this applies to most people, like you're Chinese or Filipinos. You can go to an aunt's house in, in your native country, and they'll, they'll take you in like nothing. You don't even have to ask about, you know, opening the refrigerator and asking for milk or anything. So this idea of family values, doesn't it apply to brown people? What about them? This is a painting by my brother. It's a world-famous artist, Salomon Huerta. And there's this uh, professor, uh, passed away now, uh, from Harvard. Harvard's supposed to be like the best university in the world, but what good is Harvard if they have professors like Samuel P. Huff Huntington that argued in a paper called the Hispanic Challenge, he argued that, that Europeans were superior than Mexicans and that Mexicans represented a threat to the United States. And that he literally said that. He literally said that people, white Americans, Europeans of European descent are more intelligent, are more civilized, are more advanced, than the Mexican because the Mexicans are they're more backwards because they tend to be Catholic because they, they have indigenous roots and they want to speak two languages and they're, they're dividing our country so he literally argued this and I prefer to deal with someone like Huntington because at least you know where he's where you're, he's coming from at least he's being honest and you can you can call him out on it a lot of people think this but they don't tell you they, they wait till you leave the party then they tell you, you know. right but his thinking is pervasive. This is what a lot of Americans think. There's more than about 60, 62 million Americans voted for Trump. This is what they think. Three million less than, than, than Hillary, even though Trump says three voted illegally, but there's no proof of that. More alternative facts there. So there's this dichotomy, this false dichotomy. Usually it's a black and white issue, but I'm arguing that like as of today, what we're thinking, what we're looking, on a national level, it's, it's becoming a white-brown issue. It's becoming a white-Muslim issue. It's becoming a white against Chinese. Now, now the, the country, the leaders of our country are dividing us into groups, us versus them. And this is what I'm against. I'm against this dichotomy, this false dichotomy. is the superior versus the inferior. The light skin is beautiful, the dark skin is ugly. And you see this play out. And it's not just in the United States. If you go to Mexico, uh, a lot of the, the people that are light skinned are more are the people in power, are the rich you know people that are, have the money, are the people in the in the novelas, right? Not that I watch novelas, but if I were, I could see them. And then you have the indigenous people, or the servants, and so on and so forth. So this idea of race and the complexion is not limited to the United States. It's, you see it in Latin, throughout Latin America and, and throughout the world. And like I said, this is not a political issue for me, uh, per se, or, or, or scholarly. It's also personal. It's a picture of my parents here. Good-looking man right there, my father. He kind of looks like somebody I know without glasses. Um, you know, he, he came from a tough, a tough background. He came from the, uh, the rancho in Michoacan, and they're famous for, you know, for their family feuds. They had, like, it was like the Hatfields and the McCoys. You know, they, we had a family feud. I wasn't around back then, but... My family had a, they had to leave uh, their rancho because it was, my, my family, the Huertas were, were in feud with another family, and they ended up killing one of my uncles, and then, you know, they, they killed back, and so on and so forth. So my father never, you know, <clears throat> never left home without his gun. He always had it with him. So, it's, for me, it's personal. This is a picture of my brother. Um, he's the one to the left. And I'm the little one there, they're the better looking one. Uh, so I'm what some people called, uh, what some Americans or conservatives call, uh, what they call is a, an anchor baby. So during the time, I, my parents went from Michoacan to, it's a label I reject, but that's what they call me. So when my parents went from Michoacan to Tijuana in the 1960s, what ended up happening was my mother was working as a domestic worker in, in San Diego. She would go back and forth, and she had a work visa. And in the work visa in the back, it never said you can't have kids in the United States, so they should have put that in there. So technically, she wasn't breaking the law. 
Uh, and even if she was, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, so she ended up having me here in the United States, uh, in Sacramento. I don't know how she got to Sacramento. <laughs> uh, it's one of her, um, my madrina, you know, gave her a ride over there. But um, I thought San Diego was closer, but it's okay. So, so what ended up happening is I, once I was born, you know, four months later, I came back uh, to Tijuana. So I was raised in the first four years of my life in Tijuana. And when you're poor and when you're Mexican, and when you speak Spanish, and when your parents don't go to school, guess what? You don't think anything of that. You don't even think that you're poor. You don't even think that you're Mexican. You don't think anything. You're just having fun. You're just a kid. It's only until you leave that environment and you're exposed to other people that you realize, or they tell you that you're Mexican, or they tell you you're black. But when everybody's the same, you don't have that you don't have that issue. So a lot of times when people see these pictures, you know, because I grew up like in a shanty house, they feel sorry for me and everything. And I ask for donations, that doesn't work. But I said, you know what, you know, don't feel sorry for me because I wasn't miserable. I wasn't, I didn't feel anything because I was with my family. So we, after Tijuana, we, we ended up going to, uh, my mother applied for uh, public housing and we went to Ramona Gardens Housing Projects. She didn't know. She didn't know it was one of the most violent uh, housing projects in, in Western Calif uh, in the Western United States. So my mother had an idea. She had an idea. One day she told my father, I was 13, my, my, my brother was, was 15, she, t she said to my, because my mom, she was brilliant. If she was still alive, she would have literally had two PhDs and I'm lazy compared to her. So she had a brilliant idea. She, it wasn't brilliant to me, it was brilliant to her. Is that, she, she told my father, I want you to take Alvaro and Salomon to work as day laborers in Malibu so that they can know how, to, how hard it is to work. And after that terrible idea that she had, it was like literally, it was like she sent me to Guantanamo Bay. I was like tortured. You know, being raised an American teenager, you're like lazy. American teenagers are lazy compared to immigrants. I was like suffering. And, and one day after I couldn't take it anymore and I started crying, you know, after I was pulling weeds all, all day in the summer. I was gonna report her to the Department of Social Services, you know, for torture. <laughs> and then I was literally crying and then I said, I'm going to college, I can't, <laughs> I'm too lazy to work. So that's what I did. So I ended up going to Upper Bound at Occidental College. Uh, I lived there during the summers of, of my high school year. Uh, I, was, I was going to Lincoln at the time. And then I went to, straight out of high school, uh, 17 years old, I went to UCLA. Then I did some organizing, and then I got my master's at UCLA, and then I went to Berkeley, and I, I got my PhD there, in city and regional planning. So during this time, I've decided, you know, coming back and, and using whatever privilege that I have and my good looks and good humor is that I want to put all this to good use. You know, I want to do something. So what good is it that I'm very successful and highly educated if, if my people, if my cousins, my siblings, and people that look like me are being deported, are being racialized, are being discriminated against. So I try to imagine a world without borders, you know, just like Dr. Bridget Anderson of Oxford University and Dr. Michael Deere of uh, UC Berkeley. So this is where I, I, I come in and, and try to advocate a world without borders and, and, and to look at, at a world where we, we're united and not divided. So there's examples of resistance and we need to resist. We need to be nonviolent about it. Uh, but we cannot accept anybody being called uh, a derogatory term. Uh, we can't allow for any group to be banned in the United States because of the religion or lack thereof. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much.